Good morning and happy birthday, church. I say that because this is Pentecost. And today we celebrate Pentecost, which is the birth of the church. The word Pentecost comes from the Greek word, which means, which means 50. It's 50 days after the Passover. For Christians, it commemorates the church receiving the Holy Spirit. If you turn to Matthew chapter 3, verse 11, John the Baptist prophesied this day. He said in verse 11, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he, meaning Jesus, who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So here we have John the Baptist given the prophecy of this first Pentecost. And that's why we wear, wear red on Pentecost. The red represents the fire that came down, uh, the tongues of fire that came down upon the apostles. If you would now turn to John 14, verse 15. Here's where Jesus tells us that he's going to send the counselor. The counselor is the Holy Spirit. John 14, 15 says, If you love me, you will obey what I command. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor. And that's a capital C in counselor, which means the Holy Spirit. To be with you forever. The Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. He's talking again about the Holy Spirit. But you know him. For he lives with you and will and will be in you. Notice he's talking future, will be in you. Now the Holy Spirit has always been present working in the world. His first appearance actually comes in Genesis verse 2. In Genesis verse 1 verse 2, he says, The earth was without form and void. And darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So there we are. The second verse of the entire Bible tells us of the Holy Spirit. He's always been with God's people. He appeared as a cloud by day and a pillar of fire at night to lead the nation of Israel through the wilderness. You can read that in the book of Exodus. Now, the Holy Spirit has always had a relationship with some people of the Old Testament, what we call the, the heroes of the Old Testament, those who follow God's law. He gave them power, love, life, hope, boldness, morality, and holiness. These virtues were given selectively. Okay, it was only given selectively. But on Pentecost, God imparted, God the Holy Spirit imparted these virtues on the church. Now, don't get this confused. These are not the fruits of the Spirit as given in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Those fruits of the Spirit, some of them are the same as those virtues, but the fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So this is what the Holy Spirit gave to us as born-again Christians. He gave this to us, and it wasn't selectively. Everyone who is born again 
receives those gifts because we are filled with the Holy Spirit when we come to the cross in repentance and ask for forgiveness. So those gifts belong to us. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to use them all. We should, but we all are fallible. We make mistakes, but the gifts is there. We have no excuse to say, well, I don't have that gift of the Spirit. Yes, you do. You may not be using it, but you got it. The Holy Spirit demonstrated his presence first with the apostles on Pentecost. And now he demonstrates his presence through the church. If you would turn to uh, Acts chapter 1. Now, this is before Jesus ascended into heaven. In verse 4, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem. This is Jesus telling them that. But to wait for the promise of the Father, which is the Holy Spirit, which he said, You have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water. He's talking about John the Baptist. But you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, again, Jesus speaking, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Here Jesus tells us that the, uh, his disciples to wait for the gift of the Holy Spirit. They would receive power to be his witnesses to the end of the earth. It was 10 days after Jesus ascended into heaven. Remember, they had gone to Galilee, which was a, quite a distance from Jerusalem. They went to Galilee. They met with Jesus. They watched him ascend into heaven. He gave them their last final commands. And then the men returned to Jerusalem and gathered together in faith and prayer. They did this uh, in the, what, what we, is known as the upper room. Now, you've got to remember something. These people were scared. Jesus had been crucified. And the Romans and the Jews themselves were coming against Christians. The Romans, because the, the Christians would not recognize Caesar as God, and the Jews were against them because the Jews said they were heretics. So the Christians were scared from both groups. So they huddled together in the upper room in prayer. If you would now, turn to Acts chapter 2. In verse 1, we're going to start. It says, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven, as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Oh, I'm sorry. I messed that up. And they, uh, verse 4, And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were 
and there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men, from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused, because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? A little bit of history. Why were all these people from different nations, they were all Jews, by the way, why were they all in Jerusalem? Well, if you remember, when Jesus made his entry into Jerusalem, his triumphant entrance on, on a donkey, the place was filled. The reason was, is it was Passover, Passover week. Of all the feasts that, the, that God gave to the, to the Jews under the Mosaic law, three of them required them to be in Jerusalem. And one of them, one of those three was Passover. So you had Jews from all these different countries under the Roman Empire come to Jerusalem for Passover. So that's why they were all there, and that's why they all spoke different languages. Now drop down to verse 13. In verse 13 of chapter 2, it says, Others mocking said, they are full of new wine. At this point, Peter, in boldness from the Holy Spirit, which just descended on them, stands in front of this crowd. Thousands. There are thousands in this crowd. And Peter says in verse 14, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, these are the eleven uh, apostles, remember Judas has been dead, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. Boy, what boldness. He was afraid before the Holy Spirit came, and look how bold he is now. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. Now, the Old Testament, the, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit only came down selected people. Only selected people. But Joel predicted that the day would come when the Holy Spirit would be poured out on every believer. So Peter is now uh, quoting Joel. Peter says in verse 17, And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my manservants and on my maidservants I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath. Blood and fire and vapor and smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So that's Peter quoting Joel's prophecy. So what did we learn from this? On the day of Pentecost, the Spirit's presence announces itself as a mighty rushing wind. A wind that even the thousands of people outside were able to hear. Then tongues of fire appear on the heads of the apostles and, and the disciples, and they begin to speak in a language they haven't learned. It's estimated that there were about 120 people there in that upper room. And all of them, not just the apostles, but all, the Holy Spirit fell on all of them. Their fear was immediately gone. Remember, they were hunkering down. They were scared. But the fear had gone. 
Peter boldly proclaims that the wind, the fire, the speech is what the prophet Joel spoke of, the coming of the Spirit on God's people. They were given the power of communication. Peter used it to begin the ministry for which Jesus had prepared him. So that was Peter's very first sermon. He never gave a sermon prior to that. Now, the Holy Spirit didn't change their personalities any. He changed their hearts, their motives, and their desires. That's what changed. Peter was a changed man when he, when he preached that first sermon about Jesus. <coughs> Excuse me. This is the name Peter. Who This is the same Peter who 53 days prior to this, has said about Jesus, I never knew him. We denied him three times, remember? 53 days before this. Now he's out there proclaiming the risen Christ. Peter stood before many of the same people who shouted crucify him on the day Jesus stood trial in Jerusalem. This is just part of that same crowd. Now, Peter declared in uncertain terms the man who had ordered to be crucified was actually the Son of God. Peter went from being frightened to being fearless. Peter didn't simply change his mind. Peter himself was changed. But this applied to all of them. But Peter is the one who gave the sermon, so we're concentrating on him. Something happened to Peter and the other apostles and disciples to set them on fire for Jesus to such a degree that it was said of them in Acts 17, verse 6, here are those who are turning the world upside down. And that's exactly what happened. The whole world began to change from that day on, for, for 2,000 years, it's been going on, that change. So what happened to them and what needs to happen to everyone who calls himself a dis disciple of Christ? That's what, this is what Pentecost is about. As the Spirit gives these disciples unity purity, and boldness. He also gave them the ability to proclaim the gospel in many languages. And isn't that what's happening today? The gospel is being proclaimed throughout the world in, I don't know how many languages there are, a couple of hundred? I don't know. But it's being proclaimed in every one of those languages. These weren't the words that he uttered weren't meaningless words, but the language of the people who were gathered in the, uh, in the city celebrating Pentecost. So I have a problem with Pentecostal holiness and the fact that it sounds like babbling to me. But in this case, these people understood the languages. The languages were in their own tongue. And like I said, they came from all parts, all nations of the Roman Empire that day. Now, the Holy Spirit is no respecter of persons. He's poured out on all believers. So it doesn't matter how long you've been a believer or how short a time you've been a believer. He's no respecter of that you get the full benefit whether you are 12 years old or 112 years old. When you accept Jesus, you get the full benefit. It makes no difference. He's no respecter of persons. Joel mentions that young men will see visions and old men will dream dreams. A lot of that's going on right now throughout the world. 
The Holy Spirit not only introduces signs of God's grace, he also introduces God's judgment. We saw that in the last few verses that we read, didn't we? We saw that about the smoke and the fire and the and all of that. He's talking about the end times, the tribulation period. So the Holy Spirit not only gives us um, signs of God's grace, he also shows the signs of God's judgment. So it's a double-edged sword. Jesus said the Holy Spirit will convict mankind. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. If you do something wrong, you commit a sin. Hopefully, you regret it. The world calls it your conscience is bothering you. It's not your conscience. It's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is saying, ah, you, uh, you sinned. Now you need to go and Confess and repent of that sin. That's the Holy Spirit. That's not, that's not what the world understands. They think it's the conscience. It's not your conscience. Even if you're an unbeliever, it's not your conscience. The Holy Spirit is purpose is to convict people of their sin and bring them to Jesus Christ. So there's no such thing as your conscience bothering you. There's no such thing. I don't care if you're a believer or not. It's not your conscience. It's the Holy Spirit. Remember, God doesn't want to lose anyone. No one. He wants all to come to repentance. Well, how, do you do, how does he do that? He convicts them of the sin in their life so that they will have an opportunity to accept Jesus Christ and be born again and have eternal life. This conviction comes in three ways. There's the conviction of sin. The Holy Spirit shows the unbelieving sinners how they fail to accept Jesus as their Messiah. So that's the conviction of sin. The next one is conviction of righteousness. The Holy Spirit will show the world that Jesus' life was the one and only example of righteousness. And that the Holy Spirit will convict the hearts of mankind because they cannot live up to that standard of righteousness that Jesus had. The third is the conviction and world judgment. There's a judgment coming because Satan, who is the prince of this world, now stands condemned. If you choose the world, you're also condemned. He is the prince of the world. If you choose the world, he is your prince. You are condemned just like he is. In Peter's sermon, he wants to communicate that the Holy Spirit comes both in judgment as well as in grace. When Peter concludes his uh, quotation from Joel's prophecy in Acts uh, 2 verse 21 Peter says and, speaking of Joel speaking Joel's words and it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved so he has just told us the um, judgments that are going to come upon the world during that seven-year tribulation. But at the end, he ends that, not on that bad, sour note. He says, And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So he ends it on a positive note. The work of the Holy Spirit is to speak of Jesus Christ. That's his main job. If you would turn to John chapter 16, let's look at this. These are going to be Jesus' words, and he, too, 
foretells of the coming of the Holy Spirit. In verse 13, it starts, Jesus speaking, However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he shall take of what is mine and declare it to you. Remember, that's Jesus talking about himself. The Holy Spirit will take it and declare what Jesus said to, to us, basically. All things that the Father has are mine. You know, everything the Father has belongs to Jesus. Therefore, I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. Okay, so the Holy Spirit is going to not only convict us, but the Holy Spirit is going to recall to our mind and hearts all that Jesus spoke of. Jesus reminded his disciples that the work of the Holy Spirit is not to draw attention to the himself, not to draw attention to the Holy Spirit. That's not his job, but to point us toward Jesus. That's his job. Move the sinners towards Jesus. If they're already saved, convict them when they sin so that they come back and confess and repent. Jesus is the hope of the world. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. The work of the Holy Spirit is take what belongs to Jesus and make it known to the world. So now we know who Jesus is from just those three verses. He's the hope of the world, the way, the truth, and the life. And that's what the Holy Spirit tells, reminds us believers and tells the unbeliever. Pentecost reminds us that we all have the Holy Spirit that was poured out upon the first century church. What they received 2,000 years ago is the same thing that an individual who comes to this cross today receives. They didn't get any respect. Remember, Holy Spirit is not a respecter of persons. Just because the apostles were right there with Jesus doesn't make them any more filled with the Holy Spirit than we are. Pentecost is a reminder that we're co-heirs with Christ. We're heirs to the kingdom of God. Think about that. Co-heirs. I think they said that Bill Gates is one of the most uh, uh, richest men in the world. Either he is or he's right up there with them. Supposing you were Bill Gates' son or daughter and you knew that you were an heir to all that money, all those billions upon billions of dollars, that'd make you feel pretty good, wouldn't it? Just knowing that, man, I'm going to get this someday. Well, all that's going to be burned up. We are heirs to heaven, God's place. God's home. I'd much rather be an heir to God's home than to somebody like Bill Gates' home. Something's going to be burned up. We're going to be heirs to something that is perfect without a single flaw for all eternity. Pe uh, Pentecost also reminds us that we're to, to suffer with Jesus and we'll be glorified with him. We suffer with him will be glorified with him. In 1 Corinthians, Paul tells us that the manifestation of the Spirit is given to for the common good. That's why we got the Spirit, for our common good. And in 1 Corinthians, he says that we were all baptized by one Spirit into one body. And in Romans, Paul tells us that the spirit which raised Jesus from the dead lives inside all believers. 
So these are these are the advantages that we have as being believers. All of these things belong to us. The gift of the Holy Spirit was promised and given to all believers. It was promised for all who will call upon the name of the Lord. Hopefully everybody who's here in this sermon today has done that. Hopefully there are some of you who haven't done it and will do it because of something that I said or something that I read to you. The Holy Spirit, to this day, for the past 2,000 years, continues the ministry of Jesus. When Jesus ascended into heaven, his ministry ended. Not the content of it. We, that's why we have the Bible. But Jesus himself was now in heaven, not on the earth. But the Holy Spirit is still in the hearts and the temple of the believers. So the Holy Spirit continues the ministry of Jesus, the ministry of salvation, the ministry of hope, and the ministry of renewal. Those are the three ministries, salvation, hope, and renewal. This is what Jesus taught. The Holy Spirit does the same thing today. And that's the good news of Pentecost. Let's bow our heads for a closing prayer. Father, we thank you for the time we spent together as a family in Christ Jesus, learning more and more about you and your son. Thank you for the comfort that comes from hearing your word. And we pray that we as a church body will continue to put your words into practice. Thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit, our guarantee of eternal life. We pray that your Holy Spirit will convict those watching who have not given their life to Christ and that they will do so today. We pray that we will reach each, recognize our spiritual gifts and use them to advance the kingdom of Christ. We pray for the boldness that Peter possessed so that we might also reach the unsaved world with the gospel. Father, guide our steps this week. Protect us from evil and provide for every need. Also, protect us from this virus that has come upon the earth and bring this disease and this quarantine to a quick end. Open up our economy again so the businesses can thrive and provide workers with incomes. We pray for our leaders and ask that you give them sound minds and godly wisdom in this time of crisis. We thank you for the provi provisions, protections, and your plan of redemption through Christ's substitutionary death, burial, and resurrection. We pray that those who seek your face will find a spirit-filled church where the full, true, and uncompromised gospel is preached. And to you, Father, we thank you and give you all the praise, honor, and glory which is yours. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to have communion now, and I know some of you share on the Lord's Supper at home. If so, Gather the elements of communion and join with us. And Deacon, if you would take care of that. Thank you. For those of you who must leave now, I thank you for being with us. 
today and hope that you'll join us again next week. Till next time, be blessed. Maranatha. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 27 to 29, Paul tells us before we come to the Lord's table that we should examine ourselves so that we take the bread and wine in a worthy manner. Paul writes, Therefore, whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Let's bow our heads for a minute and ask the Lord to prepare us in a worthy manner. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we start in verse 23. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice on our behalf. It is through communion that we celebrate your victory over death, over sin, and over hell. And that you won this for each of us on Calvary's cross. This was an act of perfect love and has made us children of God, indwelling us with your Holy Spirit and declaring us righteous in our Father's sight through which we are assured eternal life with you. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you all for being with us today. Until next time, be blessed. Maranatha. Maranatha.